Uh, one last thing before uh, we get started. Uh, the next reflection essay, which is the last, is due a week from tomorrow. It's due November 6th, so a week from tomorrow. We turn now in our survey to the 18th century, the 1700s. And we're gradually getting closer to our contemporary period. Certainly, hopefully you've noticed some things as we've taken an examination in other time periods of ways in which things that happened even back in the second, third, fourth century have impact on us today. But certainly as we get closer to our time period, we'll see a lot more of those things where you can say, okay, well that's why things exist the way they do today. As we talk about politics, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some things going on in Russia, uh, because that will become important as we get closer to the 20th century. And we haven't really talked about orthodoxy recently. Things, of course, have been going on in orthodoxy. Uh, throughout the Middle Ages, there were several times of uh, reform uh, as well. The difficulty for a lot of Orthodox Christians is that they were living in Muslim-controlled lands. And so their practice was limited to some extent uh, in the sense that there was an impact from the Muslim uh, presence there. But we noted how Orthodoxy, the center of Orthodoxy, had moved to Moscow in the latter part of those Middle Ages, the early modern period. And so the Patriarchate of Moscow is the only uh, Patriarchate, as we get into this time period, that is not under Muslim control. I want to talk about two main rulers during this 18th century. There are some more, we'll briefly touch on those, but there's two main rulers, both of those known as greatest rulers in Russian history at this time. First one, of course, that we're talking about is Peter the Great. He was born in 1672 to the imperial family, and ten years later, he was joint czar, T-S-A-R, or C-Z-A-R, depending on which, what you look up, uh, with his half-brother in 1682. And this, the czar, essentially, the, the word's kind of related to the word Caesar, so it's uh, connected with the idea of emperor which, of course, there wasn't one in the eastern part of Christianity. Um, and so in Moscow, they had picked up that term to refer to their leaders. But what we begin to see with Peter the Great's reign uh, and others uh, in this time period is that there is more of a separation developing between church and state. Uh, the model, that Constantinian model that had been so prevalent in the Eastern Empire of the emperor and the church working together starts to break apart. Uh, during his young adulthood, uh, Peter would often hold drinking parties uh, where he and his friends would make fun of a variety of things, but including those related to the Orthodox Church, uh, communion, the bishops, uh, and even marriage. Right? So there's this kind of uh, the church isn't something uh, solemn and sac sacrosanct, but instead something that could be made fun of. His half-brother died in the year 1696, and he also forced his half-sister into becoming a nun, and so he managed to gain uh, total power for himself. But another impact that Peter brings is his desire to make Russia more modern and more Western. Which, of course, brought opposition from many of the bishops uh, in Russia, including the Patriarch of Moscow. And so there's that opposition between church and state. Peter uh, and others in the aristocracy wanted to wear Western European attire, like suits, shave their beards off. They began adopting the Western calendar in year. Which, on the surface, we might say, what's the, what's the problem here? Well, for a lot of Russians, holding on to last vestiges of that Eastern European part of Christendom, 
some of these things were rejections of things that they had worked so hard to maintain against Western Europe, uh, especially those religious things. The Patriarch of Moscow died in, in 1700, and for the next 20 years or so, Peter enacted uh, a variety of laws that gradually decreased the power of the church. Largely what he's looking at is Europe and how they're developing with Protestantism this state church concept, where a lot of the heads of state, like in England, had power over the church. And that's what he wants to see in Russia as well. Additionally, he's looking upon these other forms of Christianity and thinking of them as true, but true for the states they're in. So Lutheranism, Lutheranism in Germany, Anglicanism for Angla, England, and Orthodoxy for Russia. That's what's true for Russians is Orthodoxy. But Lutheranism is also true for the Germans, Anglicanism for England. In 1701, he will abolish the Moscow Patriarchate and place the church under the control of the emperor. 1701. Yes, 1701. Several bishops, of course, complain about this, but he removes them from their positions as well. In 1718, a few years after this, a conspiracy develops to release Peter's first wife, who had been forced into a convent like his sister, his half-sister had been, and have their son, Peter and his first wife's son, crowned as czar. Even though Peter had remarried and did not look favorably on this son from his first marriage. So Peter begins this investigation trying to find out who has been trying to do this. He's using torture against the accused, including his son who dies in the process. Others, including several of the clergy, are sentenced to death. Peter claims all sorts of religious authority because he has one, he has a bishop who is very favorable to him. And so he, this bishop is essentially writing a theological justification for Peter's actions and his rule in the church. He does eventually establish a council to replace the patriarch. But he requires any of the people on the council to, uh, to give an oath of allegiance to Peter. He encourages the publication of various documents meant to educate the people on the doctrines of the faith because he looks at Russia and Russian people and believes that they are becoming too superstitious. He thought they relied too much on rituals like singing, Icon veneration, lighting with candles, and they didn't know the basics of the faith. Eventually he will die in 1725. Uh, some of his policies remained, others reverted back to what they were. For the next 40 years, Russia was ruled over by three empresses, starting with Peter's second wife. Eventually, however, Catherine, actually Catherine II, eventually known as Catherine the Great, carried out a coup and took the throne. She was German, so there was some resistance from Russians because of thinking of her as a foreigner. She eventually overthrows her husband, Peter III, who was reigning with her, who was the nephew of the previous woman that got overthrown, and they would eventually have him murdered. So Peter the Great and Catherine the Great are much like Herod the Great in that they established their rule through a lot of violence and power. When it comes to Christianity, especially Russian Orthodoxy, Catherine's faith was often a political maneuver rather than personal faith. feeling that it's really going to connect the people to her if she looks religious, right? because of how many people uh, in Russia were Orthodox. But privately, she's very influenced by Enlightenment thinking. We'll talk about the Enlightenment here in a little bit. And so she's not very committed religiously. She did push, or she did encourage uh, freedom of religion in some places. There were others, there were Catholics, there were uh, certainly Protestants as well as Orthodox. There were even Muslims and Jews in Russia at the time. 
On the other hand, she would confiscate church properties, put them under the control of the state, ultimately making Russia a more secular country, which many point to as causing a spiritual decay in Russian orthodoxy throughout the rest of the 18th century. Eventually, her son uh, would succeed her. He was much more religious, but would even make more grandiose claims than others had. He claimed he was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, for example. Also politically, uh, important politically in the 18th century was the American War of Independence, or the Revolution. The revolution was a largely a political event, but there were a couple of things where religion was tied into some of those things. There were concerns about Catholics, uh, Catholics um, being given special provisions in Canada, for example, and so there was a concern that the, the crown would do that in uh, England as well. There were a few other things where there were ministers who were speaking for the patriot cause, believing that it was a just cause to overthrow the king, to revolt. But largely the revolution as a political event had more Im impact on Christianity than Christianity had on encouraging the revolution. And there were a couple of things that are very important in thinking about how this political event shaped religion. One, of course, of the biggest one was the, was the idea of religious freedom. Now, we have talked about how there have been moments in various societies in various times where there has been notions of religious freedom, but with the crafting of the First Amendment, that religious freedom was not only extended to people, it ultimately laid the case for separating religious influence from the state and the state influence from religion. And so even though it's not in the First Amendment, this notion of separation of church and state. Now, the United States has always had a complex relationship between church and state. Church and state have rarely ever truly been separate. A perfect example of this is that the phrase separation of church and state, of course, doesn't appear in the Constitution or the First Amendment, but appears in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to some Baptists in Connecticut. These Baptists in Connecticut were concerned that with the establishment of religion in the states, right, many of the states kept the state church after the Constitution. Um, in Connecticut, that state church was the Congregationalist Church, which was the heirs of the Puritans. And so the Baptists, who are minority, are concerned that they are going to have that, you know, that that's going to affect them because the state church is the Congregationalist Church. And so Jefferson responds that the, within the First Amendment, there has actually been a wall built separating church from state. And gradually, those state churches would be done away with. There are no state churches in our states today. But... So Jefferson writes this letter talking about this wall between church and state. The next day, Sunday, he goes to a worship service held in the Capitol building. All right? So on one side he says, there is, there's this separation of church and state, and then the next day he's present in a service that demonstrates there isn't that separation of church and state. So we've had a complex relationship like that throughout the centuries where there has been this intermingling. Uh, even today, the question of can the United States support a faith-based office within the federal government through which funds are given for faith organizations to do community service type works, offer community service programs. Um, you know, a lot of people would argue that's not separation of church and state. Uh, so we have this rather complex relationship. With the separation of church and state, we have the rise of denominationalism. And I said, wait a second, there have been denominations before. We talked about the rise of the Baptists, uh, you know, the Anglicans, Presbyterians were, were in the reading. Yes, but 
In many of those cases, we can't talk about them as denominations like what we think about them today because they were often under a state church. Right? The Baptists were under the Church of England. Um, the Presbyterian Church was the state church in Scotland, but under the Church of England in England. With separation of the church and state and religious freedom, denominations had a, people viewed denominations differently. Many people thinking, well, they're all just separate paths to the same place. Right? Versus the old state church concept where this is a state church and anybody else is uh, operating against it. But also, kind of with that denominationalism, is the fact that church attendance, church membership, officially became voluntary. You weren't required to be a member of a church. But that meant, along with disestablishment, right? There's no established state church as we go through the 19th century. That meant that if you wanted to survive as a church, you had to be appealing to people, right? There had to be something about you, your doctrine, your practice, something that made people want to join your church, because otherwise, they would go to someplace else. They're not forced to go to this particular religious group by state order. And so religion became a voluntary thing. And then finally, for a lot of people, Christianity especially and patriotism were very closely intertwined. To be a good Christian in the United States was to be a patriot. To be a patriot was to be a good Christian. And so this idea of the intertwining of patriotism. And we still see that uh, today among some people. There, there's a close tie in the minds of many people between uh, patriotism, support of the United States, and uh, Christianity. 